Welcome to episode 101 of the Live with the Maverick podcast. The theme of today's discussion is actuaries and software. And we are very excited to have with us our guest, Marcella Granados Lavoy. Marcella is principal, global head of insurance at Databricks. So, welcome, Marcella. Thank you, Dominic, for having me. I'm a big fan of your podcast and I'm excited to be talking to you today. It is a pleasure to have you as well. And, and thanks for the compliment and, and apologies if I hope I pronounce everything right. I did Spanish for five years, but sometimes I, I don't <laughs> always roll my R's and do my tildes right. So hopefully I, I got your name right enough. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's good enough. Thank you. Great. So just love to give you an opportunity. You know, before before we get into it, I was excited about today's episode because we're in the same space and I feel like, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're going to talk about, I'm going to be able to relate to. So I think it'll be fun for both. It's always fun, but you know, that that's something I noticed. It's I think it's gonna be fun. But just love to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. So uh Marcela Granados, I am a principal and global head of insurance here at Databricks, been an actuary since um I guess 17 years old when I started to um pursue the career back in my hometown in Mexico. And now here at Databricks, just uh, doing everything I can to bring technology to solve business problems. Excellent. Uh, no, I mentioned one thing that we had in common is that we're both actuaries working in the software space. So what was your motivation for going into the software space? Yeah, so I think that, um, as you said, anybody that does insurance, um, you normally do it to just fulfill the promise to the policyholders to just be there when they need you the most. I think that what's had changed, um, and you probably can relate to given your experience as well, is that a lot of the information that you need uh, to answer questions, to pay losses on time, to be able to price adequately, it still relies in a lot of legacy system. And uh, people are frustrated. I think that what we saw in the insurance industry when Lemonade um, you know, became a, a very innovative company, wrote a lot of the insure techs, was that um, companies wanted or, or the expectations of the policyholders were to just be able to have personalized experiences Meaning, you know, a lot of people compared to just like, I want to be the Amazon of insurance. I want to be the Netflix of insurance. You want your uh, claims to be paid on time and you want to be able to be underwritten uh, within minutes. And the technology that you would need to be able to do things fast, better, cheaper uh, cannot happen really without um, software and people being able to utilize that software to fulfill the promises to the policyholders on time and accurately. I love that answer. And I typically don't do this, but I'm going to just quickly insert what my reason was, because I think, I mean, one yes. of the benefits of this show is is for actuaries to know the range of what they can do. So how I thought of it, you know, I went into software. What what year did you go in? What year did you start the Databricks again? It was uh, two and a half years ago. So yeah, like uh, right after the pandemic. Okay, so we're we're right on par because I was just over three, so not too far from that. But for me, it was about helping to helping companies to modernize. I'd done the TED talk around what July or so, of 2021, and one of the things I talked about was actuaries being smarter in terms of how they use technology so they can maximize insights and minimize mechanics. And and so it was about modernization. I'd been on teams where where I'd seen a lot of manual work done, challenges. So, you know, manual work, actuaries get discouraged because they're not providing some of those value-added insights that they're trained to do. Issues with governance and compliance because of things like in inconsistent coding, inaccuracies. So, for and, and that had issues, like I said, downstream implications and retention. So for me, it was more about modernization or, or sorry, it was about similar themes. But that was, you know, that's how I personally thought of it. So just, I just thought I'd add that for anyone who's listening. I think there's, there's, it's a, obviously a slightly smaller space, but plenty of opportunity within this, this, this software space. And I think that will only continue to increase with time as, as you know, technology and, and AI becomes more mainstream. So yeah, I think that there's a 
I would say there's few of us right now, just like really jumping into technology, but there's a lot of interest, especially the young actuaries, I feel that they want to know what else can actually be doing other than insurance or than consulting. And I see, and I'm sure you see it as well, more and more of us uh, providing value uh, because of everything you say, especially around the modernization of the actuarial function, for sure. I agree, fully agree. That's what I'm seeing as well. No, something that one might ask is why would a software company need an actuary? Actuaries, of course, traditionally work in insurance companies, are, like you said, insurance-based consulting. So they may be thinking, of course, software companies have developers and and engineers and people like that. But why why does a software company need an actuary? So um, I think it's a that's that's a very good question. I um, for me, I was I was in consulting and and I was happy. Uh, but the more and more what I see these software companies is a lot of times they've seen as software vendors. Right. I mean, you're providing technology, right? In consulting, you're you're actually uh, you know, promoting your people in the insurance industry, you're doing your business as usual. But in technology, um, you know, you you're really just doing the software as a service. And uh what happens a lot of time is that in order for you to like understand where does your software fit into um, you know, whatever your client is, you need to understand things like what are their strategic priorities, right? Like what are their goals? How do they get paid? How do they get uh, measure and monitor? And um, what are the pain points with the current technology that they have? And I, I, I definitely think that when a software company, when somebody works for software is trying to have those strategic conversations, you know, the client on the other side is just like, why would I be telling you what my priorities are? Like, you're only a software vendor, right? But um, we are seeing a lot of changes to that where these software companies want to be trusted advisors. And to be trusted advisors, you need to speak the language of the customer. Um, so going back to what was my experience, I was approached uh, by Databricks. They were in the process of sub-verticalizing because you know they we have a lot of, and I'm sure you see it the same with your company, right? With SaaS that the there's products and then there's features of the product. So the the way that you are able to show your technical capabilities is very horizontal, right? So I love your comment about governance because everybody's trying to understand um, you know, like where is the data coming from? who use the data, who modify it, access control. So, uh, you know, that governance component is something that can be applicable to all industries, retail, manufacturing, media, entertainment, banks. But then what happens is that when you're providing that point of view, you know, what I was telling you, you're trying to have this very strategic conversation with somebody and you're asking them about their priorities or their use cases, um, you really cannot do that without understanding the vertical piece of it. So taking it back to insurance, there's the insurance value chain where you have to do things like quoting, onboarding, uh, underwriting, pricing, claims, marketing, distribution, you name it. And I feel like people like you and I, or you know, even like anybody that has taken actuarial exams, you understand that insurance value chain, you understand the use cases, and you're able to not only speak the language of the customer, but also quantify the benefits. I think that the quantification, being able to put numbers behind the value that any solution can provide is absolutely critical. Yes, the, the loss ratios, expense, ra expense ratios, combined ratios, ROI, right. all those things. And I certainly what you what you said resonated with me in terms of understanding the client's challenges. This that we call those discovery calls. I'm sure you have those those as well. And what what never ceases to amaze me is, and I'll tell it again to anyone who's considering this particular space, is you because I I came from a larger company, much larger company where we had hundreds of actuaries. So when you're at a large, if you happen to be because some people are in a smaller company, if you happen to be at a larger company, you may feel like you're just one of many and. Maybe your expertise is just, just somewhere in the middle and on par. But when you go to a, a smaller company where no one understands insurance, there's a lot of reliance on you. <laughs> is that, has that been your experience? That was, certainly has been my experience. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Um, I I think that's something that I, I do here at Databricks is um, enablement. 
enablement and training. And uh, that's why, again, the, the actual exams, uh, at least I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very, very proud. I, I was never, I think I told you when, when we're preparing for this, I, uh, I was able to pass my exams, the lower level exams, relatively quickly, but then struggle, uh, you know, to 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 pass the last couple of exams. And at first, I was just like, you know, do I really believe in the rigor of factorial exams? And now that I go back to your point about being one of the few people, at least here uh, in Databricks, that know the industry really well, I give a lot of credit to just the the actual exam syllabus as well, because, um, yeah, I mean, like I I think that. Um, you know, my role here at Databricks is global, so I do have the privilege of traveling all over the world. But at the same time, I, I have a family, <laughs> you know, I have I have a young daughter, um, Sophia. So if you're looking at me, uh, your mom <laughs> says hi. <laughs> and I host hey, it. And um, there's no way that I could be traveling around the world uh, and scaling and taking our solutions, uh, you know, without the right enablement. So to your point, um, and this is actually, it's an interesting point because the way that we were thinking about enablement before was just like what I was telling you on those discovery calls, having you know the 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 trends around insurance, connecting those horizontal product features to the vertical functions of insurance, quantification of use cases, uh, business outcomes, but something that. Um, really has accelerated the development of enablement plans is generative AI, right? Like I feel like nowadays you can go to ChatGPT, you can go to Perplexity AI and at least like have the basics of the structure on just how to have that almost like next best action or advisor uh, based on what you're hearing from the customer. But of course, you know, like there's nothing that really compares to having the actual experience, like, you know, like somebody like you and I would have that now we're working in software. Sure. And we'll talk about a bit about generative AI a bit later on. Looking forward to that. You mentioned Databricks a few times. Databricks, I think, is a fairly, from my understanding, is a fairly young company. And your current role is principal global head of insurance at Databricks. So how do you describe your company and current role? Yeah, so I'll start with the company. Uh, so we're a data and AI platform. And it's funny because uh, when we started as a company, we were the creators of a lot of uh, open source products. So some of you may have used Apache Spark for processing engine. You may have used uh, Delta for storage and uh, MLflow for a lot of the ML ops, like putting a lot of predictive models into production. And to be honest with you, we almost went bankrupt. Uh, there's there's an article uh, by Forbes magazine that's called Accidental Billionaires that talk about the origins of, of Databricks and how, uh, you know, back in the day in 2013, uh, people were really not um, bought into the whole idea of open source, open standards. Because like, why would you actually take something that is available for free if there are a lot of companies that had offer, um, you know, licenses and products that are going to be validated, that, um, you know, they're going to be responsible for the liability. So long story short, what happened with Databricks is that even when we were calling ourselves like, yes, we're like the data and AI platform, back in the day, uh, people did not believe in AI. I mean, not everybody, but a lot, like a lot of times we would say like, we're the data and AI platform. <laughs> uh, and now obviously everything changed. And basically what we do is um, anything from just data ingestion, transformation. So think about all of the times that you need to just clean your data, reconcile the information, you build your models, you fine tune your models, and then ultimately you um, get to insights. So anybody would need to just visualize their data and Databricks does that end-to-end -end processing of the data to take it to insights and ultimately to um, actionable items. So, um, you know, I can I can probably as a follow-up, just give you links on just, you know, without even thinking about Databricks, how does Delta um, and a lot of these products work and how, the data engineers, the data scientists, um, and even the actuaries can collaborate in one platform. But that's um, the the secret sauce around Databricks was really the compute, because we, you know, a lot of these companies when they were trying to do some of the things that you were outlining earlier on, like the modernization, 
uh, you have a lot of data you're storing, uh, but that data, when you when it comes time to process it, um, you know, it would take a long time. Just, you know, putting it back to just like something that probably uh, everybody would relate to. Um, you know, you have Excel and at some yeah. point, you know, Excel may be okay if you're doing like a what if analysis, but if you're doing simulations, if you're doing, you know, your, your data is increasing in terms of volume, Excel at some point breaks. So what Databricks was able to figure out, it started as a Netflix context, um, actually. Uh, but it was just like, how can you do like recommendation engines? How can you have an engine that would separate the compute versus the storage to mm -hmm. just like process data really, really fast? So we started as, a, as an ETL company, meaning extract, transform, and then load back the data. But now we're been moving into just more of like, um, you know, the business outcomes conversation. So that's my company. Well. I mean, I don't. Yeah, sure. I mean, I I work for this company. It's, I mean, it's kind of my company because we're still pre IPO, uh, and we grown very fast. Uh, as I was telling you, two and a half years ago, I was employee three thousand one hundred and fifty two, and now uh, two and a half years later, we have more than eight thousand employees. Oh, wow. So it's um, it's crazy how much we've grown. Uh, now, in terms of what I do here at Databricks, uh, my role uh, is twofold. So on the one hand, I um, qualify a lot of these opportunities with clients. So we have we have something that we call the land and expand strategy. So we're very lucky to have 241 insurance customers. And for the ones that are already customers, sometimes I participate in executive briefings. So just one-on-one uh, know, -on -one connections with executives. Um, sometimes it's a chief actuary. Sometimes is the chief technology officer. If we are uh, running sales plays around underwriting, sometimes it'll be the chief underwriting officer. And that's where I think that the actuarial background really shines. Because I can tell you, Dominic, there hasn't been one time that I've been in a room talking to either a business or a technology person. And within my intro, I say I'm an actuary. I get a certain level of respect that um, you know feels good. It feels good to have that credibility. So the executive briefings where I'm able to share the point of view that we have as a company, but I also get to learn a lot about the customers. So I'll give you an example. When 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 I joined Databricks and of course the question became, can actuaries use Databricks? Um, to be honest with you, the answer was no because our platform was very um, geared towards uh, people that coded. So you would log in into a Databricks workspace and it wasn't low code, no code. It was literally, you you had to code in a notebook, like a Python notebook, right? Or just like any language notebook. And at that point, um, you know, there are actuaries that code. And I know we're going to get into that um, later um, in the podcast. But the reality is just that uh, it wasn't necessarily a tool that would feed actuaries. Um, so what happened is that during the conversations I was having with clients and I was trying to understand the use cases that they wanted to activate, it dawned to me that we needed to make Databricks simpler. So the beauty of working for a smaller company, as you were alluding to earlier, is that, you know, our CEO, everybody here is like equal. I mean, I'm sure you can see <laughs> from like this crystal yes. office that mm -hmm. there's there's really no offices, right? Like everybody sits in a cubicle. Mm -hmm. uh, there's little to no hierarchical structure. So I did talk to our CEO, Ali Gotzi, and I said, listen, we need to make the product, um, you know, simpler and, and more appealing to non-technical user. And I wouldn't claim that I was the one that really motivated that, but I was able to somehow influence a product team. So they started launching, um, you know, a version of Databricks, um, you know, it's called Genie, like Genie or like Data Room, where somebody can ask questions in natural language. And the UI, the user interface is very, very simple. Like you just like type, it's kind of like a chatbot. Do you type a question, like what you were saying, like, I want to know what my loss ratio has been over the past five years for personal auto. And it gives you the answer and you can click on a visualization. And I, I think that's very powerful because then the impact that I can have, not only for my customers, but also influencing the product that we're building can be huge. And then, so that's one side, right? Like just like talking, talking to customers, doing a lot of public speaking, 
um, I do get to travel around the world and and just uh, keynote conferences um, around Databricks. Sometimes I do partner with other technology companies. So uh, I was in Switzerland and I actually got to present uh, with your colleagues from SAS. Uh, yeah, in ser yeah. And service now. And which one? Which ones? Which ones? I I have to look at like their yeah, okay. names. Uh, I have to look at their names, okay. but it felt really good because it was it was a an event that was hosted by EY in Switzerland, and they wanted to just like bring best in class technology uh, that influences a lot of the ecosystem and insurance companies. So it just felt good to just like not only provide my point of view but also learn from each other. So that's that's one aspect of my job. The other part that I think it's um, probably one of the most uh, fulfilling roles I've ever had is the collaboration with data engineers. So I always think that when you are, um, as you said, right, having these discovery calls and trying to think about like high value use cases, we as actuaries have to go beyond a PowerPoint. Anybody can come with a PowerPoint, right? Like, Again, going back to generative AI, you can probably add ChatGPT to put your uh, to, to to put together a, a point of view around insurance for claims or underwriting, and and that's not the hard part. I think that the hard part is to do to demo how would that work in real life, and that's where what we build um, with with the architects and the and the engineer is what we call solution accelerators, um, and demo the platform. I mean, it's basically a combination of data, blocks of code to just do the ETL piece I told you, right? The ingestion, the transformation, and then the visualization. Um, and just like, you know, go back and forth on, 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 on those solutions. And I think that that is so much more powerful than a PowerPoint, because again, it's the innovative way that it actually thinks on just the implications of what you're showing. And it's just way more than code is literally solving you know, a problem or like providing a perspective on how to solve a problem from the data all the way to the insights in the visualization. So I spent a lot of time, probably more than half of my time uh, building those solutions, uh, showing it to clients. And the reality is like, they're not necessarily plug and play. We're not in the business of like building products per se, but it shows them out of the possible. It shows them different ways that they can use the platform and it gets them, let's say 70% of the way. So uh, we were pretty happy. And, you know, that also keeps my coding skills uh, to a decent level uh, because I'm not the person that's doing the coding, but I do review the code. I do show, you know, what each piece of the code is doing. And I, I get asked like lots of questions, which, you know, in that case is just helping me a lot to think about the problem and to end. The, I can certainly relate to the product demos because I do a lot of those. We do a lot of those. I certainly do as well. And I'll tell anyone who, like you said, anyone can give a PowerPoint, but when you're doing an actual demo, it's a real test of of nerves, I think, because you're doing you're you're doing the presentation piece, but you're also you also have to manage. Okay, you're showing the functionality, and you want to demonstrate the value add as well. So there's a lot of pieces that you have to. It takes a while. I don't know. I don't know about you, but like, funny enough, like I mean, I'm a public speaker. I've done keynotes. And even when I started it, it just took me a while to get used to that. Does that specific type of presentation? Because when I'm giving a motivational speech or, or a PowerPoint, I can make it fun, entertaining. But when it comes to doing an actual product demo, there's a few moving parts that you have to yeah. manage. So, but it's a very I thought is I think it's a worthwhile challenge for anyone who might be interested. I just had one follow up, quick follow up on Databricks. I know you mentioned that it's global, so you get to travel everything. So it's a Global company, of course, your data and AI platform for insurance companies. Do you have like in terms of the profile of the of the the customers that you know are you is it like the broader insurance market? Do you have go after PNC versus life more? Is it smaller versus large? Just sure anything you're you're willing to share? Yeah, so um historically, a lot of the growth in insurance came from property and casualty. And I'm sure you can relate to that. I, I always think that, um, you know, take telematics, right? Like everybody was was doing telematics when, um, you know, back in the 70s or 80s, people were coming up with like, what can be a behavioral trait um, that would influence premium? It was credit score. And nowadays, uh, you know, people realize that it really doesn't make sense to have credit score because that can be, um, you know, and implicit 
way to just get into even um, discrimination or disparate impact. Uh, I'll give you the example that uh, as a Mexican, I didn't have credit score when it came to this country. And I wasn't able to rent an apartment in New York because I, I didn't have a credit card, <laughs> right? So if you are uh, charging uh, a premium for renter's insurance or homeowner's insurance uh, for, you know, based on credit, you are uh, effectively discriminated against a lot of the other countries that, you know, they, you know, they don't use uh, credit cards as often as they do here in the U.S., so uh, the rise of a lot of the semi-structured data like telematics, IoT, the PNC industry have been leveraging that for quite a while. Um, so when I joined Databricks, the majority of our customers were PNC. I think that's something that uh, we've seen is now, like when I look at the growth of life insurance and annuity versus PNC, uh, Life is growing at a faster rate than PNC. I think it's also because the denominator of, of, of PNC is larger, right? Because as I told you, like historically, a lot of our first insurance customers were PNC. But definitely, um, you know, considering even the regulation, right? Like take IFRS 17, where a lot of times you need to uh, do what they call time travel, go back in time a year ago, two years ago, rerun an analysis, do a lot of scenario testing. Uh, that, going back to the conversation we're having around Excel, I'm telling you, your Excel is probably going to break at some point, especially if you're a large company. So uh, in in that case, the, the, the growth in life and annuity is definitely accelerating. PNC still represents about 60% of our premium and life and annuity around, you know, 40. But I think that at some point, you know, it may be 50-50. In terms of the types of customers that we target. Um, at the beginning, it was the, the tier one companies. Um, so we currently have 85% as an example of like the top 20 PNCs. But if you think about it, any everybody needs a data platform, right? And sometimes I, I do get, um, you know, when I travel to the Midwest, as an example, to just like see clients that are maybe like the tier two. So think about like, insurance company number 21, if you rank them by market share all the way to like 50, um, they're very appreciative. <laughs> you know, they're very appreciative to just having somebody going and spending time with them, understanding, you know, what, what I was saying earlier on, or like, what are the pain points, what technology they're using. So um, I'm spending more and more time with also the tier two, like again, going back to the landing and expanding concept. So with the land, um, I spend time to just like, you know, qualifying the platform, thinking about how uh, our platform can play well with the other technologies in our ecosystem. So we do see a lot of companies, of course, using SaaS, uh, using uh, Microsoft Power BI, you know, whatever visualization of their choice. But then we have to uh, paint a picture on a reference architecture on like how Databricks uh, can be used alongside with that technology. Um, so again, you know, more on the, on the tier two companies that we're spending time. And then with the tier ones, we're just maintaining, uh, the consumption and the relationship and like educating them a little bit about how they can be using our platform. And then lastly, in terms of ge geographic footprint, uh, we have what we call top 10 regions. So it is, uh, Canada, us, Brazil the UK, France, Australia, uh, I'm trying to think, um, Amsterdam, Japan, and I'm forgetting two more. Uh, so I got eight out of the 10. But, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. just, just, just as an example, last week I was in Mexico and Mexico was not a top 10, but I was able to talk to my boss and say like, listen, like it, it is, it is kind of like the chicken and the egg, right? Like if, of course, these 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 regions are top ten because they're large, right? And they have most at least for insurance, they have most of the insurance companies. But that doesn't mean that other emerging uh, regions uh, we shouldn't be investing. I mean, of course, we should be investing, right? Because a lot of these companies also have global operations. So, um, you know, I had the privilege of just going back to my own country, and hopefully, like we just actually announced that we're opening an office in Mexico City. So I'm hoping that at some point, 
Mexico can be part of the top 10. So that's that's kind of like the segmentation on just like how we view the coverage. Uh, but it's a, it's a great opportunity. I think like anybody that's an actuary that is starting in insurance, you know, at some point um, can actually work their way if, if there's interest, of course, you know, to, to get to roles like the one that you and I have, which is insurance for technology, leveraging our technical and communication skills. Yeah, Mexico, I, I talked about it on a previous episode. I had an episode of Alejandro in actuaries in Latin America. Also, on, and there's a page on uh, Instagram called Actuaries X. I think it's Actuaries X Mexico or so Actuaries or Actuaries from Mexico. <laughs> Have lots of good memes and, and content. So lots of stuff happening in Mexico. Now, let's talk about the cloud because I like to talk about the kind of the baseline for some of the, you know, the platform and the analyses that will be done um, through Databricks and through similar software platforms. Now, we can talk about modernization, digital transformation, and unstructured data without talking about the cloud. So for those of us who may not be familiar with what the cloud means, what is it or what the cloud is? What is it and why is it relevant? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the 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 cloud in um, just very general terms, right? It's just how do you get your data out of legacy system and help with uh, compute, right? So I told you a little bit about how, at least for our company, we have, there's a place where you store your data and then um, there's a place where you actually do the computation. And we made the decision uh, very early on that we would not exist on premises. We would only exist on the cloud. And we made that decision because when you think about um, the rise of big data, right? Like, I mean, there's been a lot of books published by the American Academy of Actuaries and both the CAS and the SOA, um, the, the three Bs, right? Uh, the velocity of the data, right? Like the frequency, uh, taking it back to the IoT example or even Fitbits, uh, the data comes almost like real time. You cannot process real time data on premises. It has to be on the cloud, right? Like, I mean, it's just like the data centers that you see from Google, from like Amazon and from Microsoft, uh, you know, that's, 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 that's the technology that enables you to just like get out of the velocity of data. The other piece that I think it's um, undeniable right now in this world is the variety of data. So what I mean by that is just the whole spectrum of unstructured data. Think about the threshold trough of all of the data that you would have going back to insurance again uh, with uh, text. Uh, claims adjuster notes, they're normally text. Policy forms for underwriting, it's text, it's pages, it's PDF, right? Like it's, there's still like, even from a distribution perspective, a lot of the information that comes or just even like your trends adjustments, your like applications would all be part of an email or a PDF. So I feel like the insurance industry have been leveraged a lot of the text piece of unstructured data, but it shouldn't stop there. You have video, you have images, you have audio, and there's so much information that is in there that without a platform or without the cloud, uh, you wouldn't be able to just not only access the data that is sitting on all of those unstructured ways, but also process that data and ultimately fit into the pipeline. So that's variety. Um, and then um, volume, right? So I talk about velocity, I talk about variety, and then the volume of data that nowadays everybody's processing uh, is becoming uh, bigger and bigger, right? So like, again, you know, like there's so many insurance companies that are being part of the, of the um, you know, whole portfolio. But if you think about it, whether or not you grow organically or through acquisition, data is only going to increase, right? And a lot of the uh, technology that you would have to process that information, you know, would not work unless um, you're on the cloud. The, the other piece that I think it's important and you probably can relate to, uh, given your uh, your background also in predictive modeling. Um, you know, back in the day when you were running a generalizing our model for pricing and you were coming up with the coefficients and everything that we learned in the exams, uh, the in the past, right? And I'm talking about probably when I was in the industry um, back in 2012, 2013, you will have the coefficients of a GLM. You will like document that, give it back to IT, and then IT will put it into production. 
uh, what we're seeing is that uh, any time that you're trying to test different algorithms and actually deploy those models uh, live and just like, you know, being able to just like have the policyholders receiving their, their premium uh, almost like instantly, right? Like as the renewal comes or, uh, you know, it's incorporating a lot of these behavioral traits, uh, you cannot deploy models on-prem, like you have to do it on the cloud if you want to go from batch into streaming. So I think it's a combination of that, like the the, the three Bs, the need uh, to deploy models effectively, as well as just considering, um, you know, everything else that goes into how um, legacy system would no longer work and having data on-prem, sometimes it was thought to, to be safe. But if you look at like a lot of the data and privacy breaches, it actually it did they they didn't occur in the cloud. It was like on prem. So we're seeing a definite shift towards the cloud. Not everybody is on the cloud, and not all of the workloads are on the cloud. Uh, but there's definitely a, a trend towards um, you know moving from on prem to cloud. Certainly, I'm seeing the same thing. And one example you had used for for more limited cases where where companies are not moving to the cloud, I guess, uh, low I think it's a low frequency, high severity. If you're doing a low frequency, high severity line of business, then perhaps it may not be as pragmatic, but certainly on my end, I'm seeing, you know, very similar. A lot of companies have, you know, very clear technology roadmaps that do involve some degree of cloud migration. So. Yeah, exactly. And like, I, um, you know, just even thinking about operational systems like Guidewire, right? Guidewire, we have uh, we're part of their marketplace, and um, you know they do offer the on-prem version, but they also offer the cloud version, which is cloud data access, and you can see it probably with every technology. Um, and again, it's not it's not easy. I think that even right now, a lot of companies are even considering cloud economics, uh, and just like the before and after things that would have to consider change management. But it's definitely where uh, you can you can even do a lot of like um, you know testing of use cases. I mean, I I can tell you even right now, right? Like generative AI uh, has to be uh, you know whatever form of generative AI that you're doing, like it wouldn't exist without the cloud. So whether you like it or not, that's what it was going to be in the future. But it's not a once and for all change. I think it's obviously you know incrementally, and it has to be very strategic. So you took the ro the words right out of my mouth. I was actually going to say that we talked about the platform and what enables us to do these analyses. And and the next thing I was going to ask about was generative AI. Now, since large language models such as ChatGPT became um, mainstream, the term generative AI has become a very common or very popular buzzword. Now, how do you how would you describe generative AI? So, I would say that. Uh... It, it is a form of um, deep learning. Uh, so, you know, normally the, the way that people depict uh, generative AI starts with like, you know, the, the big uh, circle, which is AI. Then you have machine learning, that's a form of AI. Uh, and all of that, you know, like uh, probably the simplest way is just how to emulate the human brain right? That's what is called artificial intelligence. That is called machine learning. So you teach the machine to think like a human. But after that, you have uh, deep learning um, and then you have neural networks. And within the deep learning space, uh, you know, you're basically looking at not only the relationship that certain features would have on your predictive variables. So let's take premium for homeowners insurance. You know that it is related to maybe square footage and neighborhood, right? Like that's like a simple equation that we learn in our Excel exams, you know, bam, it's just like a linear equation. But what neural networks allow you to do is not only to look at the relationship that the predictive variables we have in premium. So, you know, how square footage affects your premium, how neighborhood affects premium, but also they have what they call hidden layers, which is why it's called neural networks because it kind of like simulates how your brain is thinking. So then in this case, it would, consider the interrelationships between the predictive variables. So it would also consider how does the square footage varies, um, how does your premium vary by square footage correlated with the neighborhood you're in, 
right? Of course, in, you're in a fancier neighborhood, you have to normalize by the fact that like, you know, the houses are bigger, right? And the bigger the house, the bigger the problem. So all of a sudden you start thinking about a lot of different correlations, not only between the X's and the Y, but like all of the different predictor variables. So within that concept, um, the, you know, what change with generative AI is the GPs, like what you're actually generating. So in comparison to the traditional uh, technologies that you would use, right, going back to the claims adjusters node, um, if you want to mine information from text, you don't need generative AI. It's just like OCR, right, like optical character recognition to uh, digitize that information. And then you just run natural language process to just like know what to look for in a document. With generative AI, what you're generating is, let's say, a summary of that information. So... Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. Think about Google two years ago when you would like ask something like, um, I want to understand, uh, I want to know who the Maverick actually is, right? So <laughs> you type something like that and it will give you a source. Maybe it would like link exactly to uh, your, your website and it would show you everything that you've done. Now, Google search engine is powered by uh, Google Gemini. So now if I were to ask the same question and I say, I want to understand the highlights of the interview that the Maverick actually did with Alejandro Ortega around Latin America, it would not only point to the source, but it would give a summary of your interview with Alejandro, right? So it's generating something new. It's summarizing information. It's helping you create code um, so if you want to say, I want to do a cluster analysis based on, again, you know, going back to the homeowner's example, mm -hmm. uh, square footage and neighborhood on this data code in Python, it generates the code. It completes, uh, you know, the, the sentence, right? Like it, it creates something new. So I think that's very, very innovative because you're really not just pointing to a source, but you're giving something that has not been created. But the challenge with that is, uh, you know, what's called hallucinations, that since it's actually being uh, performed by technology, it's very hard to uh, for you to even question uh, what you're getting. So hallucination is giving you a wrong answer, uh, but, you know, it's given to you in a very confident way, right? So sometimes you just like take whatever you're getting for granted. And, you know, like something that sometimes we give the example is... Um, General Motors had launched a generative AI solution to just help customers uh, with product recommendations. And somebody, you know, one of the customers is a, is a very famous use case where um, somebody asked a question like, what is the best pickup truck? And the chatbot uh, powered by generative AI, because of course chatbots have been around for a while, but now, it, it, you know, it's the fact that it's more intelligent, it's generating something new. They recommended the Ford F-150. Right, because it didn't understand the context that this was a chatbot for General Motors, right? So it shouldn't really go to the competitor. So that's just an example of how powerful this new technology can be and how does that compare to traditional uh, you know, AI machine learning and also what are the risks that come with generating that new content. Yes, and for anyone looking to understand large language models better, I had the privilege of interviewing Eric Siegel on episode 43. So we talked about some of the foundations of large language models, such as GPT, how they work, and some of the shortcomings that you mentioned in terms of accuracy. Uh, so certainly check that out if you want to understand those foundations better. So we talked about what generative AI is. I'll give you actually add on one example because recently I was using GPT and I was just fooling around with it, quite frankly, and asking it to to generate a business plan for this idea I had. And it you know, came up with a very concrete business plan, but not only did it generate a business plan, it then said, would you like me to look at streaming options and technology? And it just kept asking me questions. It's like we're having a conversation and it knew. So it wasn't just retrieving or extracting insights that I asked it to do. It was continuing the conversation and thinking of you know what I may ask next. So that that I thought was an interesting example, but we you know we talked about the foundations of of general generative AI, AI sorry, and what it is. So how can generative AI be, uh, help to yield value for insurance companies? Because we're seeing it now more commonly in the insurance. At least it's still fairly. I mean, it's fairly new in terms of its application, perhaps in the insurance space. But how are you seeing that happen? 
Yeah, so um, I would say like three different ways. Um, the the first one is on the going back to that unstructured data piece that we're talking about. Uh, something very very cool that I've seen um, being developed is using AI functions to create descriptions of an accident, right? So, uh, you know, of course, if you're a claim adjuster, you can look at the picture of a car and just determine whether or not it's total loss. But just like any function, an AI function, you can put parameters. So as an example, you can look at what is the average severity of the accident? What were the weather conditions uh, that were present at the time of the accident? and incorporate as SME knowledge, like, you know, skid marks, right? So I think that's very, very clever. And then I'm sure you you guys, uh, some of you may have heard that just like there's a good side of using Gen AI, there's also bad side. So there's a lot of bad actors that are creating fake images, uh, you know, of people like the deep fake, right? Or, mm -hmm. or you know, fake images of a car, right? So then what do you do with that? Um, so within the same AI functions, um, you know, we had something that's called AI query that compares uh, the human generated description of this car accident to the AI generated description and is able to just identify where the discrepancy is and the root cause. And I think that's very, very powerful uh, because again, you know, like the, the technology became downstream and really democratized based on, as you said, right, like chat GPT. But if you actually look at a lot of the algorithms, just like even vector databases, like how you do embeddings to do retrieval augmented generation, that's actually in our electoral exams. So I always try to think about, you know, when I'm reading something very, very technical, I'll take it back to concepts that I understand before. Um, and that's something that, again, in insurance, just like uh, images, right? Um, and this is still around the same uh, claims and underwriting. I think that within marketing, uh, you know, you pointed out correctly that a lot of, um, you know, just like new content can be generated. Uh, if you think about the concept of customer lifetime value and having product recommendations, a lot of insurance companies are using generative AI to just not only, you know, when somebody calls your insurance company, you may be calling to report a claim. You may be calling to understand your coverage. Uh, you want to know uh, what your deductibles and limits may be. So, um, you know, that's not new, right? Like everybody can call your insurance company, but what Generative AI allows you to do is not only the speech to text, but you can do things like the intent, measure intent. Why are you calling? Number two, you can do sentiment analysis all in one platform, right? And then ultimately, you can guide and give recommendations around, again, you know, the cross-sell, upsell, the product, the coverage, triaging the person, uh, you know, whenever maybe, maybe you got into an accident, right? And you don't want to talk to an IVR. You want to talk to an actual person. All of that can be done through the Transformers architecture, which is the T piece of the chat GPT. Um, to just like really understand, uh, you know, what action you should be doing next. Um, so that's that's some of the um, uh, external facing use cases. The the main thing that companies are doing is um, the internal use cases. So what I mean by that is every single employee of a company can probably use generative AI to be more productive. So think about having your own executive assistant. Um, and again, the technology is already there where now you go into a call and you automatically are able to summarize the call, uh, know what the next steps are, and even looking at very complex structures, maybe like the org chart, so that when you look at how you should be prioritizing, responding to emails, the technology can help you do that. Um, and then even identify uh, the way that you would respond to an email, right? So it learns from your behavior, it learns from your pattern, and then ultimately can help you, can have huge productivity gains. So um, internally, of course, it's easier to just put into test a lot of your Gen AI use cases so that you can learn and then you can take it externally so that you don't have the problem of like the hallucination example I gave you um, earlier on manufacturing. Yeah, that last example where you talked about the meeting transcription sounds a lot like Copilot, I think, from what I've exactly. seen. So, you know, we've 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 spent some time now just to recap because I know we've we've talked about a lot, a lot of good stuff. We've talked about actuaries in software, what the what why you know how you got into software, 
the motivation for our software companies, hiring actuaries. We've talked about the cloud. And then we spoke a little bit about uh, generative AI and, of course, Databricks. You know, spent some time talking about Databricks. So let's pivot slightly to, to a related subject. It's related to the, the broader theme is, is programming, programming and coding. Those are relevant skills for the modern actuary, especially if you're going to work in software or in tech. No, I, my understanding is that you have some, you know, after you finished the actuarial exams, you did spend some time developing skills uh, in R and Python. So how do you get experience with that? And, and you know, what I, I get this question all the time from my followers and it's, it's a question I've always kind of struggled with at, at times or certainly people more senior than me is what level of proficiency do actuaries need in programming and coding today? Um, you know, of course, coding being a subset of programming, which is more the broad algorithmic design, but how much proficiency? So how do you get involved and what are your thoughts on proficiency need for actuaries? Um, I think that it depends on the role and it depends on the example that you were given on just like low frequency, high severity. So if you're dealing with, you know, a small company that's doing excess and surplus line and your analysis is going in Excel, uh, you know, that's fine. Uh, I think that sometimes Excel gets a bad rep just because people are like, oh, you know, like Excel is like legacy system. I, I actually think uh, Microsoft has done an incredible job making Excel relevant. You can do great things there. Um, but if you are um, doing anything where you're dealing with high volume, um, as you and I talk, right? Like think about your personal lines. If you are doing anything that um, involves um, having multiple people working on the same analysis, which happens all the time, uh, you know, that collaboration cannot be done in an Excel spreadsheet. I mean, it can, but like then you have all of these tabs and you're like at the mercy of who created the um, the spreadsheet and who documented a lot of these things. So I think that that's where coding can be, um, you know, incredibly helpful uh, because, you know, you still have to document things, but um, you can do things faster, better, cheaper, right? So the example that I gave you, like, um, you know, anybody that's an actuary that does pricing, even if you want to code, um, you know, generalizing our models, uh, it's probably harder to do it in Excel. There's a lot of packages uh, that would allow you, um, you know, as an example for Python, there ha they have NumPy and Pandas to do a lot of the data transformation. Um, obviously, R was the first programming language I learned. And there's a huge academic community. There's brilliant actuaries uh, working uh, and contributing to packages in R. Uh, Marcus Gessman, who built uh, the chain ladder package. I mean, it's just, it's not only the chain ladder package to allow you to do loss development factor and reserving, but uh, he actually wrote um, a chapter in a book on predictive modeling using R that shows how uh, the chain ladder is a, it's a special case of like the broader stochastic reserving. So I think that the, I, I would advise you there's, if there's one thing that you can take out of this podcast is don't be afraid to try things. The, the, the version of R or Python that you may have run into five years ago, they actually develop it so that it's a lot more user-friendly, it's color-coded. Um, and I think that, um, you know, all you need to do is just like get started, right? Like you, like think about how you can combine the, the most common programming languages with the power of a copilot, as you were mentioning, and just like, you know, ask, ask that question. Do a clustering analysis in R and Python, give me the code, and then from there you start iterating. I think it's incredibly powerful. The, the other piece that, um, you know, the kind of like the line that, the other line that I would draw on just whether or not you need to code is sometimes when you move up on your career and you're managing people, uh, you may think that you don't, need to code anymore because probably the younger person can code uh, in a more efficient manner. Uh, but you still need to, just like anything you do as a manager, right? Like you still need to review that what they're doing is actually sound and like you can run the code yourself. So I think that to answer your question, I, I don't think the actuaries need, actuaries need to code as well as a data scientist or a data engineer, but you have to have a minimum level of proficiency. Again, depends depending on the role, depending on your line of business, depending on your company. Uh, and that that skill set is something that uh, can be can make you a unicorn, 
right? Like actuaries by definition, we're very, very technical. We, we are good at measure, manage, monitor risk, which can be applicable to anything. Um, as you advance your career, you become a better communicator. And if on top of that, you add the coding component, you become the unicorn. And you know your skill set, and you know you you have more choices at least when it comes to like finding your dream job. That's true. Very few people have both uh, in terms of that unicorn concept. No, you you mentioned you just mentioned data engineers, and I had a question to ask on collaboration. So actuaries, actuaries, data scientists, and data engineers they have, you know, different skill sets. They maybe, for instance, with actuaries and data scientists, perhaps some type of overlap. Well, you know, so in, in spite of their different skill sets, they are working w within the context of insurance, at least, are working, you know, on the benefit of the same client or the same company. So how can the three work together for the benefit of, of the company or the client? And I remember when we spoke before, you had a very nice illustration of just for you broke it down into what actuaries do, what data science, data engineers, data scientists. And but the key is like, how can they, how can we make this collaborative and not adversarial? I know certainly specifically with actuaries or data scientists, a lot of people talk about how many, how much ground actuaries are losing to the data, data scientists. And like I mentioned in the pre-meet, you know, I don't, I don't see it that way. I, I see it as some things that minimal overlap, but definitely things that are separate and distinct. So thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'll give you the example of like um, back in uh, consulting. Uh, so I can probably tell you that there's never been a time that I feel more, proud of being an actuary because every single time that we needed to uh, build a predictive model and put it into production, you know, everything that we've been talking about, it all starts like it's not, I feel like the problem that people, uh, the the mistake that sometimes people make, it's just like, it starts with the data, right? And it starts with the data and you crunch your data. Uh, your data engineers are the ones that are building these pipelines. So they're robust and they don't fail, right? Uh, the um, data scientist would be the one that's like fine-tuning the model, right? And then the actuary would be the one presenting the analysis. But the the mistake lies on the fact that before you start pulling the data, right? You cannot pull all of the data that you have. So you always start the problem with business hypotheses. So if you're trying to determine even how to segment your business to do reserving, if you're trying to look at like what is the right marketing approach or like, you know, pricing or just reinsurance, you always need an actuary to start thinking about what do I think is correlated with adverse loss ratio? Um, and then with those business hypotheses, you put your data request and then you give it to your data engineers. So they're the ones that are pulling the data. Uh, I mean, think about age, something simple, right? You're not going to pull every single age range, right? Uh, because you have like every single age of, of like driver times territory times, um, you know, like uh, number of accidents. All of a sudden, the number of combination and permutations becomes unmanageable. So right off the bat, you have an actuary that would do things that make sense. Like, okay, well, if I'm a driver, I probably uh, not going to have anybody, uh, you know, younger than 21 years old, right? And maybe after 65, that's when like your, your vision started deteriorating. So you would always have actuaries helping with not only the binning uh, of the variables, but also the correlation. Uh, again, you know, like things that we learn in our exam. So that significantly runs more efficient, makes even the data engineering job more efficient because you're not pulling the whole data and just like throwing everything into a predictive model, right? You're guiding how you should be thinking about the data, the correlation between the variables, how you should be grouping and segmenting things. Of course, within the, the so that's data engineers with actuaries. I think that as you pointed out correctly, um, you know there is a lot of overlap between data scientists and actuaries. But again, um, the the data scientists would be able to just like test uh, algorithms that maybe neural networks that we were discussing, or the gradient boosting machines, right, or generative um, additive models. But the actuary is going to be the one that would be able to say like, hey, I know who my regulator who my department of insurance, I know how likely they are to accept this technique versus this other technique. I know how to provide justification and have that balance between, yeah, maybe a more accurate, a, a more 
a sophisticated algorithm it would give me more um, accuracy, but at the same time, it's not as transparent of a generalized linear model because you know the formula by heart, right? So I think it's like that type of, of uh, trade-off um, and the collaboration that you would have that like, and actually it's like more of like the horizontal, right? It's involved in the business hypothesis, in pulling the data, in transforming the data, in thinking about like what's going to be acceptable or not acceptable by the regulator and ultimately presenting the results back to just, you know, your chief underwriting officer, your CFO, how does that affect your, your general ledger? Um, and what is the implication that ultimately would have in your policyholder? So, um, you know, from my perspective, the fact that we as actuaries, um, you know, have credentials, right? Whether it's like ACAS or FCAS or, you know, like uh, from, you know, FSA or or the other actuarial institutions, it's the rigor. It's the, the going back to what we were talking earlier, right? It's the speaking the same language that a lot of the people that are, that are working in, in the Department of Insurance, they're actuaries themselves, right? So like we, we know what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And I think that as long as there's the rigor of just having the actuarial exams and having the certification and, you know, you putting your name or you're signing an actuarial opinion, the career is not going anywhere. But we do need to collaborate. We, we need to know where the strengths and weaknesses are of the other disciplines so that ultimately we can all work together. That's a great response, Anna. I couldn't help but think from you started is when you started going through the different roles. I was thinking that for some companies like that actuary, data engineer and data scientist is the same person. So, but that's for a different episode. We won't, we won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the way that you you compartmentalize that and you kind of structure that. No, no in closing, something I want I, I noticed is that you know you were you were uh, the one of the co-founders of the organization of Latino actuaries. And you're actually the current president. Great organization, by the way. I know lots of people there. Ale, Danny Fernandez, everyone. Why? So why was it important for you to get involved with this organization? Um, two reasons. I um, as I was saying, I'm a I'm a very proud actually, but I'm also a very proud Latina. Um, and I was actually inspired by IABA. Uh, I was in one of the CAS conferences getting my ACAS and I saw um, an a IABA champion getting on stage talking about how when you look at the population um, of, of the world and you look at Black people, right, um, you know, it's a certain percentage. But then when you look at the population of Black people within the actuarial community, it's like very, very low. Like at less like, than 1% at the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. 1% to 2%. Um, and then I thought, well, what about Latinos? And I could not help but like look in the room full of actuaries and uh, I did not see enough Latinos. I, um, at, at that point, I, I ran into really, um, you know, great individuals like um, Adelaida Campos, uh, Lala, right? Alejandro Ortega, uh, that I have to, like in my, from my perspective, I couldn't be the only one thinking about this problem, right? So I was very lucky that I ran into them and, um, you know, we just decided that, um, you know, we, we should start an organization. We we first said like, is there is there anything out there? We quickly discovered that there was nothing out there to our knowledge. So, you know, we just founded this organization and you may be thinking about, you know, so so that's 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 the one reason why you know we all started because we said like there's a need. But then if you think about the the theme of this, uh, podcast, which is innovation. Uh, there's been many, many studies and probably conversation for another topic uh, for another day. Um, innovation comes, fostering innovation comes from diversity. And it's not only diversity of race, it's diversity of thought. And I feel like every single time, or diversity of gender, diversity of like anything, right? And when you're in a room where everybody thinks the same way, right? Everybody went to the same school. Everybody, you know, like was educated, like in the same country. Uh, you cannot help but like, just like there's not enough um, diversity. There's not enough disagreement. And I, I truly believe that being in that environment when people, it, it doesn't need to be that people are disagreeing. It's just like people may think differently, but they're open to hearing the other perspectives. Uh, that breeds innovation. And, you know, now even on the age of like technology and AI, 
we have to have in all of those roles we've been talking about, the data engineers, the actuaries, the data scientists, the business, I really think that diversity of race leads to diversity of thought and that leads to innovation. And um, I think that in order to do it right, to do it responsibly, uh, you know, we we need we need organizations like Ola, like IABA, like any any diversity organization. I think it it is propelling the whole uh, growth uh, for innovation, especially in the insurance industry. Well, shout out to Adelaida, by the way, for introducing me to you, and you know, I think that helped to enable the episode. And and you know, just to reflect on the conversation, we talk a lot about software and. Just greatly appreciative for this discussion because as somebody who's in the software space, I genuinely think that there's a, an opportunity in the future and, and those opportunities will increase for uh, actuaries who want to try something a little bit different. And it's always good to have a substantive discussion when we talk about, you know, Gen AI and large language models, cloud. Sometimes these buzzwords are thrown around, but to be able to give it substance and context and depth and dimension is, um, I think, is is helpful for the community. So I just want to thank you for your time, um, Marcella. And, you know, looking forward, are you going to the CIS meeting by chance? Um, I don't know. Um, I'll have to check, but um, just, uh, I, I was I was saying this before we started recording, but uh, I'm very impressed by your level of professionalism. Uh, I, I told you that part of the motivation to do the podcast is the incredible influence you have on younger people. Um, Adelaida first uh, asked me, he's like, do you know the Maverick actually? I'm like, of course, you know, everybody knows the Maverick <laughs> actually. People are like, oh my God, he has like 19,000 followers on LinkedIn, <laughs> yeah. right? Like I think I have 5,000, you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. thank you for everything you do, um, not only for uh, the profession to just uh, bring awareness of, uh, you know, what an actuary can do. But like, I have to say, I, I truly enjoy not only doing this podcast, but preparing um, and having this discussion. And, um, you know, I actually think that other you being an influencer, a very good influencer in all of the uh, social media channels, I think, you know, you can, we are probably a big inspiration for a lot of actuaries that are trying to uh, get a little bit outside the insurance role, the consulting world. And um, thanks for everything you do for, for the actuarial profession and technology and kudos on your job as well deeply humbled and um you know just thank you and you know really appreciate your time i was, I was gonna say something and it's totally just slipped my mind but maybe it's time to to wrap up <laughs> i know <laughs> like i'm looking at the clock too i'm like i can probably talk for an i probably can, can talk to you uh for another 45 minutes but we probably need to keep it short yeah well but definitely keep in touch and um you know look forward to meeting you in person i'm sure yeah well, i was gonna i know i remember what i was gonna say i was gonna say remember to you can use this for for continuing it I found that oh, out that's, some, at some you. point in the series. So be sure to use it to leverage it for, for continuing it. So <laughs> thank you so much, Dom. Thank Have you. Have a great rest Thanks, of your Marcella. day. Thanks, Marcella. Have a great Bye. rest of your day. Bye. Bye.